prayer. We begin our service in your bulletin. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be his kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Almighty God, give us grace to cast away the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Now, in the time of this mortal life, in which your Son, Jesus Christ, came to visit us in great humility, that in the last day, when he shall come again in his glorious majesty to judge both the living and the dead, we may rise to the life immortal, through him who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Welcome to the first week of Advent. An optimist says, the war will be over, your wounds will be healed, the depression will go away, all will be better soon. The optimist may be right, but unfortunately, he or she may also be wrong. For none of us can control our circumstances. Hope does not come from positive predictions about the state of the world any more than does faith. Nor does hope depend on the ups and downs of our life's particulars. Hope, rather, has to do with God. We have hope and joy in our faith because we believe that while the world in which we live is shrouded in darkness, God has overcome the world. We follow the one who is not limited or defeated by the world's sufferings. Let us all pray together. God of power and mercy, open our hearts in welcome. Remove the things that hinder us from receiving Christ in joy, so that we may share his wisdom and become one with him when he comes in glory. For he lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from Isaiah. Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down, so that the mountains would quake at your presence, as when fires kindle brushwood, and the fire causes water to boil, to make your name known to your adversaries, so that the nations might tremble at your presence. When you did awesome deeds that we did not expect, you came down. The mountains quaked at your presence. From ages past, no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God besides you, who works for those who wait for him. You meet those gladly, do right, those who remember you in your ways, but you were angry and we sinned. 
because you hid yourself, we transgressed. We have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a filthy cloth. We all fade like a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind take us away. There is no one who calls on your name or attempts to take hold of you, for you have hidden your face from us and have delivered us into the hand of our iniquity. Yet, O oh Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay, and you are our potter. We are all the work of your hand. Do not be exceedingly angry, O oh Lord, and do not remember iniquity forever. Now consider, we are all your people. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Our psalm is Psalm 80, and we will be reading this in unison. Hear, O shepherd of Israel, leading Joseph like a flock. Shine forth, you that are enthroned upon the cherubim, in the presence of Ephraim, Benjamin, and Manasseh. Stir up your strength and come to help us. Restore us, O God of hosts. Show the light of your countenance we shall not be saved. O Lord, our God of hosts, how long will you be angered despite the prayers of your people? You have fed them with the bread of tears. You have given them bowls of tears to drink. You have made us the derision of our neighbors, and our enemies laugh us to scorn. Restore us, O God of hosts. Show the light of your countenance we shall be saved. Let your hand be upon the man of your right hand, the Son of Man you have made so strong for yourself, and so we will never turn away from you. Give us light that we may fall upon your name. Restore us, O Lord of all hosts. Show the light of your countenance, and we shall be saved. A reading from 1 Corinthians. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that has been given you in Christ Jesus. For in every way you have been enriched in him, in speech and knowledge of every kind, just as the testimony of Christ has been strengthened among you, so that you are not lacking in any spiritual gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ. He will also strengthen you to the end, so that you may be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful. By him you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. The Word of the Lord. that suffering, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will be falling from heaven and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. Then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. 
From the fig tree, learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also, when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly, I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all these things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But about that day or hour, no one knows, neither the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Beware, keep alert, for you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey when he leaves home and puts his slaves in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to be on the watch. Therefore, keep awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening, or at midnight, or at cock crow, or at dawn, or else he may find you asleep when he comes suddenly. And what I say to you, I say to all, keep awake. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Christ. Let us pray. God of hope, who brought love into this world, be the love that dwells between us. God of love, who offers peace within this world, be the peace that dwells between us. God of peace, who offers grace throughout the world, be the grace and live within us. Amen. Amen. First of all, I pray that everyone has a wonderful Thanksgiving weekend. Um, we are actually coming together here just prior to entering into Thanksgiving. Um, so I'm just going to go with the hope forward that this has been a grace-filled weekend and also this coming week. But it's also, it's also First Advent, which is actually the very first Sunday of our liturgical year. So for us, traditionally, it's Happy New Year. That's what today actually is. Um, and it's not just a new year for each. We go through this, obviously, every year. The, the ceremonies of each season are important to us. Uh, they allow us to feel the rhythms, not only of the seasons, but the rhythms of spiritual journeys, the rhythms of our relationships with one another. But the Advent time, as I think I preached to you for the first time about four weeks ago, is also a time of waiting. It's a time of anticipation. Uh, it's a time of specifically in our faith, anticipating good. It's a time of anticipating God. That is what this time is all about. It's also a time when we actually begin a new gospel. We just spent the year listening to all of the beautiful scripture readings of Matthew. And now we are actually stepping into all of the readings of Mark. Now, it's interesting because Mark is actually, as best we can tell, probably the very first gospel that was written. Um, and it's the gospel that all of the other gospels actually look to when they began to um, write their stories in regards to their relationships with Christ. So it's an interesting thing. Um, Matthew ended up writing specifically to the Jews. Uh, Luke wrote specifically to the Gentiles, although both of them kind of crossed over a bit here and there. Um, and then John. <laughs> John is very esoteric, um, he's very powerful, but he's also just absolutely so political. But when you step into the Gospel of Mark, Mark doesn't have any color commentary. He really was just trying to get the information down and get it down um, so that everybody would remember. And the reason for that clarity is the fact that um, the apostles were aging. You know, decades had passed and they had been teaching all along that Jesus was about to come. He's coming back, right? His second coming would be any minute. And so, so much of their writings, um, especially Paul's, 
We're all about, you know, like, get ready now, because it's coming right now. But as decades passed, and as they were aging, and as they were teaching, it was important for them in their own understanding of their, not only their spiritual lives, but their earthly lives, that it was very, very possible that they themselves may die before Jesus' second coming. They had to begin to look at things, not in their own timelines, but they had to begin to look at things in God's timeline. And so that was an interesting change for them um, in their own spiritual journeys. And so Mark was the first one to sort of step out in that. But when Mark wrote, he didn't have any agenda. He did not have um, any kind of specific uh, group of people that he was writing to other than the fact that he wanted to write to the people who were beginning to not only understand Jesus, but those who would come later who would need to understand who Jesus was um, as they were all beginning to pass away. And so he just wrote very clearly, very directly, almost like an old-fashioned newspaper, not with uh, an opinion page in it in any way, shape, or form. He just said, this happened, then this happened, then this happened, then this happened, then this happened. He just sort of laid it out um, the way he saw it and the way he heard it and participated in it, more so as a resource than anything else. This particular reading that we heard today in Mark, you, you would think we'd start in chapter one, right? <laughs> but we didn't. Um, Advent one is always going to start um, later on. Um, it's always going to start with, you know, what you just heard in the gospel about that next coming, you know, about all of the things that could participate, could possibly be ahead for us. And so today's reading falls somewhat not after Jesus's ministry, but pretty far down the road into Jesus's ministry. And he was beginning to teach the apostles about what was to come next. He was beginning to talk to them about um, not only his death, actually, and resurrection, but the actual fulfillment of his ministry, the actual fulfillment of um, what was so important about them all coming together and learning. He was teaching not only about the ending of his first ministry on earth, but the fact of his second coming, if you will, right? His coming back, his announcing of his leaving, and most importantly, the announcing of his return, which is why they thought it was going to happen any day, right? Um, but that's not exactly what was occurring. He had explanations of war. He had explanations of um, chaos, darkness. He had all of these um, uh, ideas and, and dreamlike situations that would cause a lot of pain and suffering and realizing that his coming would be at that time as well, even more so than the chaos in which he was born into. So his particular message um, through Mark's gospel into this community was to not get caught up. Don't get all caught up in the chaos that is around you. We could have heard that message, probably much needed it months ago, right? Not to get all caught up in the chaos and the turmoil. Focus on what you know to be true. That was the message at that point in time. Don't get distracted by all the things that are crazy around you. Prepare yourselves instead to receive what you know will be coming and what is ahead of you. That was the overall message. And here's the important thing about this particular story at this particular time in Mark. Jesus was not speaking to the whole entire group of hundreds of disciples or thousands at that point in time. He was speaking to his inner group. He was speaking to his sort of inner sanctuary, the people that he was entrusting his ministry to. And so the conversation itself, his main concerns um, were about, quite frankly, the temple system, not all the outside otherworldly um, situations and chaos that was going on, but his concern at that particular time was about the temple system. What was missing in the temple system? And what was happening within the temple system. Because the temple had become more like an institution rather than a faith-based 
community. He wanted them and was teaching them that they needed to continue to take care of the poor because at that point in time, the temple was not doing that. They were throwing those on the outside. They were not allowing them in. You know, it's where you get all of the stories of the lepers and all of the other things that were going on. Anyone that was not pure and clean and perfect and all of that kind of stuff was to be thrown out of the temple. And the temple became its own institution. The temple was about the temple, not necessarily the people. And in many, many ways, this is a message we need to hear today. You know, our entire church system um, for hundreds of years now has sort of become that institution in many ways. Um, we are trying so hard to kind of come back to and work hard into reminding ourselves that the only reason we are here to be together is to care for and take care of all of those around us. I can only imagine, especially during this time um, of COVID, where our gathering time has been just stripped away from us in so many different ways, right? We miss each other. We miss each other. I don't even know you yet, and I miss you at this point in time. It's hard to walk into these seasons and not have you here to kind of celebrate and be a part of things with. Um, but just as Jesus was concerned uh, about the temple being an institution when he was trying to teach a kingdom, we have this opportunity right now within the midst of our chaos, within the midst of our craziness that is going on around us right now to settle things down, quiet things down, and take, I hate to say it, this opportunity of COVID right now to go inner and deeper in a way that allows us to put aside all the institutionality about church and to get back to the reality of the community of church. So some of the questions that Jesus was doing, what he was preparing them to do, was preparing for change. He was preparing them for change. And so we have to ask ourselves in this time, walking into right now what you know we call here in this area a second wave of COVID, right? Um, how do we prepare? How do we wait? How do we anticipate good? How do we anticipate God? How do we do that? And what is it that we need to know? What is it? I think the first thing we need to know is that we are not waiting on God. We are not sitting here waiting on God. God is waiting on us. That's the most important thing for us to learn. It's a change in dynamics in these change of these church days. That's what is happening. And I have three different areas that I'm hearing from Christ at that time in which I want to share with you today as we go into at, um, first Advent, as we go through the entire Advent season, but also as we go into this closing down of our institutional system, this closing down of our government, this closing down of our social institution that we have and that we live in right now. The very first thing that we do from a faith-based stand is that we move from private sin our private sin, which is so easy to dwell in, right? It's so easy to, to remind ourselves, especially when we're quiet at home, um, what's wrong with us, what's painful in us. It's so easy to take a look at ourselves and not feel good when we get isolated. It's so easy to do that. But we want to move from that idea of private sin into this expectation of salvation. That's what Advent is all about. Uh, one of the things I said four weeks ago was, uh, and I can't remember if it was Walter Brueggemann who said it, um, but one of the others, that it, it's about reaching out into that dark time for God and expecting, expecting to be raised back up. My friends, God loves you. Accept it. God loves you. Expect it. God is all about grace. That's his whole thing. He offers a grace-filled love. Trust it. 
It's actually, it's actually the class that we're in. I think we're walking into our fourth week right now, which is um, the flowing grace of now. And the very first conversation we have is going to be the conversation we have on the 52nd week of the class, which is grace is offered, not deserved. It's already there in front of you. Our work is to receive it. And so utilizing this time that we have, this quieting down that we're about to walk into, it's a time to take time for that dwelling love, that dwelling grace that was, is within us. Because as we dwell in that love, we become a dwelling itself of love that we can begin to offer to other side. Take the time to dwell. Take the time to be loved by the God who is drawn to love you. He wants that love for you and from you. So be drawn toward God in this time. Be transformed into his likeness. Be transformed. Love calls. Love calls for the loss of self and the birth of a new self. And this is the time that we have in front of us to begin that new birth. Secondly, just practice Jesus. Practice simplicity. We don't really need to fill up every inch and every moment of the day, right? That's, that's the world we used to live in. If there's one thing that we've been living in, it's less stuff in our lives, less, less stuff jammed into the minutes of the day. We don't need to be filling it up with all that other stuff of the world. What we do need to be doing is recovering prayer. Recover rest, just rest. It's okay to take a nap. It's okay to just take a little easy walk and not have it be a goal, right? You don't have to time your walk. Just take a walk. Recover contemplation. Just sitting and dwelling in your mind and in your heart with God. Recover peace. Just recover peace. And then finally, finally, this is something we all do need to do, and I know it doesn't sound exciting in a lot of ways. It is for me. Um, go back to Scripture. <laughs> Just go back to scripture. The second coming isn't about fear. The second coming is about joy. The first coming was about joy. It's all about joy. The chaos and the fear is all around us, but it's only inside if you take it in. It's joy and love that we were given naturally. Jesus said that I am coming to be with you. All of us, together, to be together. The elect and the angels and all the beauty. Jesus is coming to join. That's his calling. That's what he wants from us. He is calling and coming for the creation of a new humanity. And this quiet time that we have in front of us, that we are facing again in a much deeper way, right in front of us, is an opportunity. It's an opportunity to step into that dwelling even, even further, even deeper. Just before I close, there's two facts that I don't want to pass up uh, Paul and Isaiah today, so it's just a couple of things I want you to remember with all of this. And once again, this is just the facts, ma'am. Uh, these aren't agendas or commentaries or anything else. It's just basically facts. Um, what they're trying to say very clearly is we have been made by the hand of God. That's how we were made, by the hand of God. You've got to remember that. We are God's people. That's who we are. Whatever faith tradition you are in, whatever tradition you are in within the Christian community, we are God's people. And God has given us the grace to endure. He has given that to us. We are an enduring people. We have strength until the very end. Absolutely, without a doubt. We have spiritual gifts to be put to use, and we are here to use them in whatever way they are called to be used. We've got to remember that. Friends, as we enter into this season of Advent, accept that love and that grace that God is here to offer you. It's already there. It's not anything you do. It's already right there. 
Just accept it. Prepare yourselves for fulfillment. Prepare yourselves for it. It may not be the way you want it, but it's going to be. It will be. Anticipate. Oh my gosh, anticipate peace. Because I'm a big believer that it's right in front of us as well. God bless. And may the Lord of peace be with you. Amen. Mm -hmm. Nicene Creed is found on page 358 of your prayer books, or if you're using the bulletin, right inside the bulletin. We believe in one God, the Father of the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, <clears throat> eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, Light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again, in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, with the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Creator of the stars in the sky, sun and the moon, you are the light by which we wake and work. Illumine our darkness and keep us alert. Surround your church, her leaders and people with your armor of light. We pray especially for Michael, our presiding bishop, Kevin, our bishop, and we pray for our parish clergy. Illumine our darkness and keep us alert. We pray for our leaders, especially Donald, our president, Joseph, our president-elect, and all those in government positions. Savior of the nations, guide those who govern and awaken those they lead, that we may all live in the spirit of cooperation and share so that all have enough food, care, and peace. Illumine our darkness and keep us alert. For people across the world whose spirits bend under the yoke of oppression and struggle, give the people of this community a sense of togetherness and support. Open our eyes to those who fall by the wayside and whose faces and needs remain invisible. Illumine our darkness and keep us alert. Lover of our souls, you continue to mold us in your image and hold us in your hand. We ask your blessing on those who struggle with anxiety, grief, or isolation, especially for those who suffer with mental illness. Illumine our darkness and keep us alert. Father of us all, we pray for those who have recently returned to your embrace and those who are broken with grief. Especially we pay, we pray for Paul R. Fox and Mark Engelbach, in whose loving memory the altar flowers have been given. 
illumine our darkness and keep us alert. O Lord our God, accept the fervent prayers of your people. In the multitude of your mercies, look with compassion upon us and all who turn to you for help. For you are gracious, a lover of souls, and to you we give glory, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. 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 Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. 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 My brothers and sisters in Christ, Shalom Aleichem, Salam al Messiah. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you.
is right to give him thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, because you sent your beloved Son to redeem us from sin and death and to make us heirs of him of everlasting life that when he shall come again in power and great triumph to judge the world, we may without shame or fear rejoice to behold his appearing. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
Alleluia, Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia. The gifts of God for the people of God. Prayer of reception. My Jesus, I believe that you are present in the blessed sacrament. I love thee above all things, and I desire thee in my soul. Since I cannot now receive thee sacramentally, come at least spiritually into my heart, as thou were already there. I embrace thee and unite myself wholly to thee. Permit not that I should ever be separated from thee. Amen. and thank you again for joining us today and we just invite you to be with us all through this beautiful Advent season. I also ask that you take a look at some of the announcements that are coming to you electronically, especially uh, as we will be doing a collection of clothes and things um, in the St. George's parking lot in the upcoming, I believe it's going to be December 12th. So please look for that and if you have something to give, we ask that you do that as well. In the meantime, please listen to this message. There are three T's associated with stewardship. There, there's time, there is talent, and there is treasure. Jack, did you know that there are other important words associated with stewardship? Yes. Okay. Today, Jack and I would like to add two more words to these three that we just mentioned. Okay, Jack? Our rector, 
former rector back in Washington used to periodically tell the story of what he called the good churchgoer. That's the person you saw in your pew every Sunday and as soon as the last note of the recessional was heard, that person headed out the door and you never saw them at any other time. His conclusion was that if you had enough good churchgoers in a congregation, at some point in time, you would cease to have a church. From this I get the first word, which we'd like to add to the three T's, participate. When we are launching this pledge drive, call forth your treasure, participate. Later, perhaps this year, perhaps later, when the church reopens and other activities are available, call forth your time. When the church begins to resume in-person services, we will need choir, ushers, altar guild, lectors. Call forth your talent. Participate. Joanne? And the next word that we, I find um, is an important word in stewardship is generosity. Generosity is, defi is defined by everyone according to their capacities. Generosity does not only apply to treasures, even though you find that when we talk about generosity, um, you find that money is always involved. However, it also applies to your time. It applies to your talent. What kinds of skills do you have that the church could use? What kind of special knowledge do you have that the church could use? Because with these um, skills, knowledge, time, treasures, the whole bundle, we could not sustain and grow our ministries in the church if we did not have this. So generosity is not about giving more or the most or having done the most of anything. Remember what I said, you define how generous you can be in your personal capacity. You ask yourself two questions. Am I able to do more or am I able to give more? And that's food for thought. You think about it, you don't just do it. Think about how it will impact your capacity. And what I will say to that is, when you think about it and you plan to do it and you move ahead, do it with a generous spirit and an open heart. Thank you. By any chance, if you have not yet received your materials in the mail, uh, just call the parish office and we'll make sure we get them out to you. But you can also find them online on our website. Um, and just make sure that you pray for what it is that you are able to give at this time. Uh, if you need to have any conversations about that, just give us a call as well. God bless. May each of us be so fortunate to be overtaken by God in the midst of little things. May we each be so blessed as to be finished off by God, swooping down from above or welling up from beneath, to extinguish the illusion that we are separate, that perpetuates our fears. May we, in having that illusion slain by God, be born into a new and true awareness of who we really are, one with God forever. And may we continue on in this true awareness, seeing in each and every little thing the fullness of God's presence in our lives. May we also be someone in whose presence others are better able to recognize God's presence in their lives, so that they too might know the freedom of the children of God. Blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you this day and always. Amen. Amen.
Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.